Back to Sebi documentary. Did oh, it come oh, out yet? No, no, no. Yes or no? Up. No, it did not come out. Hold on. Why are you holding me on? <laughs> fuck, my question, motherfucker. <laughs> what the fuck, man? One million percent correct. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, just relax. You want to add on? Yes. No, I want to. You know why? <laughs> no, I don't know why. Stop. The Dr. Sebi documentary. Go, go, go. What, what's going on? What's real shit? Nah, we've been cooking it, man. I mean, that's the question the street's been asking for. The, the, that's his grandson. The you mess with his grandson? All of them. Every, we interviewed he came every to kid. Pink Champs, right? So this, that, that's yeah. why. Wow. We talked to every, I mean, obviously, this is something that Nipsey started and wanted to do. Uh, he had never really actually broke ground or, you know, turned the cameras on. But, um... Even our conversations, our last conversation was really about my health and lupus. With Sebi? Uh, was, yeah, he was talking to, uh, talking about Dr. Sebi with me. So from there, that's what, I, when Nick passed, I was like the, only, the, the most intense connection we had was talking about health and wellness and, you know, empowering the community. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to take our last conversation and take it one step further. You know, I make films. This is what I do. So I'm going to take on what he wanted to do. And from there... You know, I had already been talking to, you know, Dr. Sabi's family, so we pretty much got on and started putting, you know... What, what is it that you think is the biggest thing that's coming out of the, the film that... That you think... Because you're saying people are trying to shut it down. I wouldn't so. say people are trying to shut it down, but they're not trying to make it easy, you know, to put it out. But Real quick, this is who Left Eye went, right, to yeah, to right. get... Yeah, because we, we went here. down there to Usha Village and everything. In Nicaragua? Left Eye went, yeah, uh, nah, it's in uh, Honduras. 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 Yeah. yeah. So... We went down there, filmed down there, filmed with all the family members and everything. It's a powerful documentary. We have so much footage now. The goal is, you know, Sundance, you know, Cannes, Fuck. Toronto, something like that. But because uh, I, I promised Nip's family as well as Dr. Sabi's family that we would put it out there in a way that it would be on a prestigious level that everybody. What was appreciate. Nip's? Wait, hold on, hold on. What was Nipsey's interest in it though? Like, why did was he involved? For people I that think don't just know. even just someone. He was someone that had practiced you know, up under Dr. Savi, and really, I'm not, like, I don't think he ever met him, just like I never met him, but I think he was his teachings. And when you go, like, in the hood, like, you know, in South Central, Dr. Savi has a building, it's off, so we, you see the billboards, you see all of that in L.A., so I think it was really, he, you know, Nipsey being somebody who was pro-community and, and really focused on the, the health and wellness and the upward mobility of black people, he was like, yo, we should tell this story. I think he was in the middle of an interview. We have even had that interview on the on the documentary where he said, look, if there was a man who cured AIDS, got charged for saying he could cure AIDS, and then beat, beat the charges, yeah, beat why don't we know more about that? So really, that's what the documentary is about, pretty much the entire case. Right. And, and so, you know, it's, it's coming, though. That's the one of those things where you want to do it right, and all of the people, all the interrogators are trying to stop it. We're going to make sure that the story gets out so, there. So, so, you know, it's, de it's definitely not an easy feat. I mean, when I stepped up, it was literally the day after Nip passed. I said, yeah, yeah, we I'm going to take, take it on, and I knew it was going to be heavy. And, you know, the fact that I've been blessed enough to have all of these platforms to share, I think people really going to, they're going to get so much from it. They're going to learn about the African biomineral process. They're going to learn about taking care of themselves and, you know, that the, the body is a self-healing organism. I mean, we're going to do it at a prestigious level. So this is literally my last question. I don't know this answer. The week you went through what you went through, Fly TV, mm. misquoted yeah. the minister. Ooh, that was heavy. It, it right? was a big mistake. <laughs> misquoted, made a big mistake. Yeah. He didn't get canceled. He got, he got, nah, to it, look the other way, yeah. but not canceled. You know what it is. Well, hold on. I want you to fully understand what I'm you listening. Said. I'm listening. Like he, people said, ah, cool, but there was nothing saying cancel. There's no more for black. Mm. Why? What, what was the difference between yours and black? Uh, honestly, it's the people with the power, in that sense of like the the idea of when our community. Mm -hmm comes together and say we not messing with some we got to stand firm on what where our power lies if it's our power and influence if it's our power in numbers if it's our empowered and as curators right. that community can say 
nah, that's not cool no more. Mm-hmm. Where there's other communities where if actually the person, people, whether whoever it is, if the, if it's your employer, if it's some, if it's the status quo, if it's the government, if it's the the mob rule mentality, if someone says no, we got to take that person's job from them. No, we have to take the, and that's what, and and that's why my issue with cancel culture all together because sometimes we get people who have strong opinions mm-hmm. and then you get some people who just got strong yeah, pockets it's like strong, opinion culture versus yeah, yeah, factual yeah and like, you gotta really like even when you think about like are we here to truly punish people or are we actually here for real repentance you know what i mean are you really trying to help are you trying to go grow are you trying to count are you just trying to teach a lesson are you trying to make an example out of somebody like I think that's dangerous and that's when that's the, why we have the culture of the penitentiaries now like if you think about the word penitentiary is is the root of it is repentance to actually or even repentance in that sense to where you're supposed to heal you're supposed you're supposed to go to these places to become better not just use them for storages to lock niggas up right. so right. I think in that mentality just see whether it's America or just even a culture that we operate in now they think teaching somebody a lesson or punishment is the right way but if you're really trying to heal you trying to reconcile. You trying to ha- you trying to atone. You know? Educate. Exactly. Right. So I think you know it's just really us taking it. Our, ours is like a small glimpse and not even a real problem because oh, a rich person lost their job or somebody you know like. But when you really think about our culture where we're just so quick to blame, judge, right. and then punish. Right. Where we don't even look like we don't check ourselves. We don't look for growth in, in education and healing in a true process. And there's no conversation to, to build, like debate. And and that's why our whole culture, even right now, is is in a, a dismal place from whether it is people getting locked up in the penitentiaries or even the lack of education in certain right. forms and where we may speak out of turn and we may speak something because we're just searching, we're looking to grow and find ourselves. We wanna we only want truth. We wanna live our truth, we wanna speak truth, we wanna learn truth. But if it's if you've been brainwashing us for so many years and decades and got us going in the wrong direction, it's like, well, come on, man, how are we really gonna get to it unless I want communities that are affluent, show us how you got that way. I want right. communities that own their block, show us how, like, give us those same opportunities, you know what I mean? Right, right. So whether it's the, the idea of gentrification, where it's, uh, it's social equity, all of these things we got to really bring back and in, into our communities to our next young generation. Because niggas is getting money now, but now I how you get money. Yeah, but how we keeping it? You know what I mean? Because we getting it and then we giving it right back to them. So it's like, yo, let's figure out how to. And that's realistically, they ain't buying Gucci. They buying Gucci. They ain't buying incredible. Exactly. It's just really like, and that's even. I mean, you know, I'm I'm doing my talk show out of Harlem. I'm doing a Christmas movie in Harlem. Like I'm really trying to rebuild Harlem as that entertainment oasis, that place. Like that's where all of our culture comes from. We wouldn't. If and I'm I'm taking it all the way back to the jazz days, to the Renaissance days, to those times where if if you were working uptown if you were in harlem you know every white folks was on broadway and downtown but this is where our culture was bred from jazz music which then came hip-hop where you know from from stage and theater acting which became the movie so it's like i'm just trying to show yo we have the really the the invaluable priceless equity in a place like a harlem and a place like new orleans place like Atlanta, yeah, like all like where it becomes the greater history of our country. On top of that, exactly, you know, of our culture as a country, and like we were the ones that recorded the stories. We're the storytellers, whether right. it's in the form of poetry, whether it's in the form of music, whether it's in the form of just the Langston Hughes, and the Maya Angelou's, all of those type of people right. are the true Jagnas and the people who actually. Re- Cord as griots and uh, in that sense for this generation. So I think even what y'all do here, each and every. Episode. I'm learning. I'm hearing oh, stories. Oh, we have fun. We have fun. That's it. Just real fun. recording our history. This is why we don't talk politics on this show. Yeah. Well, we too, but we, <laughs> but we, we, not, we don't also come to us. We also, we also, we also, like we were super disclaimer. We, we yeah. don't know shit. Right? We say that, right? But what's good about you was when you felt like you was naive towards the situation, you admitted that to me. No, absolutely, absolutely, and it was. I, I say. You know, even because I was coming from my podcast, which is an educational platform that I started at Howard Still University. Yeah. Appreciate you. And it was like really just bringing in professors and yeah. different people like on topics that we discussed multiple topics. So right. it came from a place of education. So if I was miseducated in any form, form hey, let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. I only want to spit truth. I mean, the... Uh, 
the minister said so many things uh, that resonated with me when I got a chance to sit down with him, all, all this. But the one thing that he said the most that stuck with me, he was like, I don't ever want to say anything that isn't true. I don't want falsehoods to come out of my mouth. So if I'm saying something that isn't correct, first of all, yeah, I... I apologize, but show me, show me where what I, because I believe what I said is the truth, and so where you get to that point, it's a, it's a really an opportunity for education, and I always say it ain't about camp culture, it's about council culture. Show somebody where you believe. If you from a different community and y'all have disagreements, right. let's talk it out. Like otherwise, but just trying to get rid of a nigga. Like who are you to try to get rid of anybody? So that's usually you know, and and I and I go back to even whether it's that situation, and I told you know. I am on talk show now. I was like, I don't know I'm gonna get canceled again, but it ain't. It's never coming from a place of malice. Like when how y'all sit and build here, ain't nobody really charging on nobody in a way with with discontent and, and hate. It's like, yo, sometimes we gonna say some shit because we joking and it's funny. Sometimes we gonna say some shit because we just literally don't know and we need to be educated. But I don't think even what we trying to accomplish, specifically even what's going on in hip hop right now, we just trying to evolve. We trying to grow. You know what I mean? We we went from calling each other niggas every day to now we calling each other kings. Okay. You know what I mean? Like that's that's real talk. You or see the Yalas or the Yami, that's the new shit in case you don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You take that. Like we, we, we Yami say means king. Yeah. Like we say drunk facts on here just to, to, to make, you know, an ex not an excuse, but to say that we're not gonna always be hundred percent factual. Right, right. We're talking, we're shooting this shit like you were talking to your homies. You're not going to always be 100% fact-checked on what you're saying. And that's the thing, because now we live in a day and age where media is at everyone's fingertips. So just as you talking shit, somebody can disagree with the shit you talking, and now y'all done went viral mm -hmm. because this side believes this and this side right. believes that. So, you know, there's a, there's a different responsibility for this generation but again we can't be we don't nobody know everything like right. and, and that's kind of where i come from a place when with all of this and even now having my own platform i always say man you can learn so much more from listening so in that in that scenario like, i want y'all do it beautifully like y'all get cats up here question, talking right? mad hours and y'all just be like let's so get get this, this is real shit let me ask you <laughs> one of your biggest records one of my favorite records. Why you laughing? <laughs> Niggas, they already know what I'm about to say. Well, oh, Kelly. <laughs> Yo, damn, bro. that was a good record. That's a great record. That was a good record. Gigolo. That was a great record. And what, what was the name for the record, though? Gigolo. Always surrounded by so many hoes. It's a great record. Great record. It's a great record. That was one of the records, too. I mean, R. Kelly made great records. This yeah, that was, down, at the though. time, I mean, everybody was working with him. I mean, and actually, the, the dope thing, him and Track Masters. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, let's come up. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, the reason yeah. why you got stories is because he was going to work with him. Yes, the remix was the most popular shit out at the moment. <laughs> trying to get like I went and like yo I need one of them fiesta type joints <laughs> and it was him and the track masters and you know they gave me they gave me two joints they gave me the feeling freaky joint with uh B2K and Omariana and then actually that one to me was like a little too kitty I was like ah it's cool and I remember I went into the studio I said Chicago and R. Kelly left me in there for 16 hours in his empty ass studio. Wow. And I'm like, and they was like, that's how he, he would make his weight. And he was like, yo, you gotta wait for your hit. How bad do you wanna hit? And I was like, I ain't leaving the studio till I mm. leave with a hit. And he finally, you know. This also sounds like the documentary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like he was doing something else. He was drawing in a beat. <laughs> I wrote three sixteens and jumped on a plane because I was frustrated. Like this nigga left me in an empty studio the whole time. So there was no. no you didn't lay anything though. I laid three sixteens. Oh. I just went in there and rapped to this beat that he left me. Then he literally the head of the label like three weeks later. Was, was like, we're going name? straight to radio with this Gigolo record. It's amazing. <laughs> like, what the fuck you talking about? Like, Did you know what's called Gigolo already? Nah, it was Barry White. Barry, yeah, Barry. Barry hit Barry But he White. named the record by the hook, right? Yeah, he's like, this Gigolo record is amazing. Oh, you didn't name the record? Nah, R. Kelly had, I guess after I laid my shit, he went in there, put that hook on it. So you didn't meet him? 
No, I had met him live. Like I said, we had already did the other records and stuff like that yeah. before. Like I was, I'm, I'm DJing in the ignition video. In Miami. We shot that shit oh, in Miami. Shit. Like it's like. <laughs> Don't play Miami, please. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, on the set. Right, he was all over Miami. On the yeah. set, Miami uh, to be in the case too. Yo, hey, okay. relax, buddy, relax. Yeah, the ignition niggas should be part of this. This really happened <laughs> on the set of the ignition video. The ignition. <laughs> the motherfucking feds arrested him. That was the day he got arrested for the child porn shit on the set of the video. In Miami. Listen, guys, Miami stop, stop guy. defaming <laughs> Miami. <laughs> <laughs> no defaming of Miami. Order the arresting him, got, he came back late that night. We shot, we shot the rest of the video. I'm just being honest. I can't take another shot. I can't take another shot.